those of you who have been following my work in recent times, both the radio show, the websites, the articles, and especially my Facebook page with the photographs I've been posting, have become aware that I'm finally pursuing my lifelong ambition to do a proper research program and a series of multimedia presentations into the megaliths of not only Britain and Ireland, but everywhere. The Standing Stones, the Cairns, the Henges, and so on. I'm also part of a documentary series that I'm making with Capricorn TV. Well, I'm a host of it, one of the hosts. And we've been visiting a lot of the sacred sites for the footage. And I've also been involved in another program called Mystery School Road Trip, which you can see the link to, to below. And I'm also writing a book on the subject, which will be coming out after Christmas. My thesis is basically that the Druids survived, that Irish mythology that was written by the Druids in the various Irish annals give testament to this in forms of allegories and stories. These Druids, I believe, infiltrated the early Christian church on these islands, not just Ireland and Britain, but also Brittany, Scandinavia, Portugal and Spain. And the reason they did this was two reasons. One, they wanted to preserve the original fate the pagan fate in a different form, which they did very successfully, which I will prove, but also to protect their people from a, a from a bloodbath by the Christians. They were very well aware of what the Roman Empire had done to other groups, such as the Gauls, the Teutonic tribes in Europe, and they were basically going to see this was going to happen to their own people. In fact, it did happen eventually with the Saxons, who were, who were wiped out by the uh, Charlemagne Empire, the Carolinians. In order to do this, the, the Druids of these islands, now the Celtic countries, now the reason why I say Celtic in italics is I don't believe there was ever a Celtic race. I think that's a product of Victorian romanticism, and I don't think there was ever a Celtic, well certainly the, certainly the Irish, the British, the Iberians and the Britons, the Bretons from Brittany, were absolutely not in any way connected culturally or otherwise to the, what they call the Celtic tribes from the Danube, the Hallstatt culture. That's just a Victorian makey up thing. A lot of it has to do with British Israelism to try and make European history fit in with the Bible. Now, one of the most apparent things that we can see this transition between paganism and Christianity, early Christianity, and the influence of Druids within this is what's called the Celtic cross which is incorrectly titled. We all know it, the shape of the cross with the circle and the four quadrants on the top. That's correctly type, untitled. That should be, it's, in Ireland, it's called a high cross. And that's, that's for a very, a very apparent reason, which I'll explain in a section. Before I get to that, we want to talk about all the theories that have been proposed for what these crosses have been given. In school, they told us in Ireland that they were used to teach the gospel to the early Christians. There's an element of truth to that, but these people just wouldn't have flocked around these uh, crosses all bewildered. They were not, would not have been that impressed. There would have to be another kind of psychological, or so, should we say, kind of a psyop aspect to it in order to get them to convert. On top of that, we have we have all kinds of recent ideas, gentlemen who come up with ideas that they were they represent quadrants of a a sextant for guiding across the sea. As romantic and as interesting as those ideas are. They still, and I do, I do encourage people to constantly put forward their own ideas on these things. But the idea of the Celtic cross being a sea navigation tool is to, comes from the same Edwardian gentleman idea that uh, you're trying to you're trying to put this this tweed jacket and pipe smoking Edwardian gentleman's consciousness on that of people in the pre-Christian area. It's not going to work. It's just like all these other ideas they have of looking for for Pi and other mathematical equations inside Stonehenge and Newgrange and so on. This is a modern idea. When you go visit these locations, the last thing you think of is a slide rule, logarithms, cosines, and algebra. That's the last way they affect you. You approach these sites in a holistic manner. You see them, ultimately they are spiritual sites, but they also have a scientific aspect to it, but it's not Western science. So therefore, I disagree a lot with the idea of applying that they're quadrant sections that to do with modern, you know, navigations of seafaring ideas. They're nothing of the sort. These people were not interested in what Vic these Edwardian gentlemen were, were not we're, we're coming from the school of classical training. The people I'm talking about, they, they, Greece and Rome meant nothing to them. So to, to imply these kind of Greco-Roman concepts towards these people who existed long before that culture existed, it's just, it's not on. It's, 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 it's a logical fallacy. It just doesn't work. So 
let's look at something in a, in a very kind of literal sense. Let's forget that there were never any kind of H.G. Wells or Sherlock Holmes type figures in, 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 our, in our common culture when we approach these ideas. So what is a Celtic cross? What is a Celtic high cross? Very simply, I believe, in, especially in, the, well, in all the early cases in Ireland anyway, and this is proven by the height, the, the North Cross at Clonmacnoise, which is on a very strategic location in the centre of Ireland, which I'll explain why that location is so important in my upcoming book. They were standing stones that had been reshaped into what we call Celtic crosses. Now, prior to the arrival of Christianity, as we know, there are thousands of these standing stones or menhirs, as they're called in Brittany, all over Britain, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Scotland, Isle of Man. They're everywhere. These stones were not just randomly selected because they were nice shapes, although the idea of a simulacra would have been important as well. When you walk down the, at the avenue in Avebury, you see stones that look like they have faces or look like animals. That was one aspect of it. But I have another theory, is that these stones are put in avenues like Avebury in straight lines and like Karnak to energize them. And these stones had a powerful electromagnetic quality. And this was highly sought after and very, would have been very apparent to people living in an age before electromagnetic pollution. Remember, there would have been no radio signals or anything back then. And these people would have detected subtle electromagnetic maybe even homes and sounds coming off these stones and this is what gave them their magical quality and this is why they were placed in strategic sites all over what they call the celtic world the atlantic seaboard celtic world the christians when they came over especially to ireland there was no other choice than other to try and get the druids were so powerful in ireland that they had to co-opt this in somehow but the druids were also a canny bunch a very canny bunch and they also knew that the the, the the new faith was so powerful and so huge that it was probably better to try and and go inside as fifth columnists than rather than throw it all up and just or, or worse still subjugate their people to a possible genocide if they tried to fight against it the celtic high crosses are simply reshaped standing stones the early ones now the conclusive proof of this one is, is not only do we have examples of stones that are shaped into crude crosses all over these islands that were originally standing stones, and in Portugal, Spain, and Brittany, but also the smoking gun is the North Cross, which is located at Clonmacnoise inside the museum in Ireland. This was never a cross. They tell you it was a cross that the top broke off. It was never a cross. It has the god Corunas on it. It has classic celtic spirals it was a standing stone and it was the earliest example that we have and it's ancient as well it seems to have a calcification of the surface or like it's been under the sea for years and this may tie in with the idea that you know i really do believe there was something like an atlantis and the so-called druidic culture has origins in this again it's an ongoing work get your classical mind away from all this and think about it without a greco roman consciousness the high cross at clonmacnoise is interesting for two reasons one it, it never was a cross they just say it was a cross it's obvious there was never a, a circular quadrant on the top it also has pagan icon you know icons on the side but also it looks much older and they also another interesting aspect is the back of it is, is smooth like it was laid up against a wall or something I think the back of it is just the rough part of the stone that wasn't carved away. Just like they, they flattened the underside of a dolmen. The same idea. The capstone of a dolmen. The undersides are flattened. These stones had powerful magnetic forces. And St. Kieran was the founder of Clonmacnoise. St. Kieran's an interesting character. We're going to be into it. Basically, he, he has all the traits of a druid who comes from the court of Maeve, Ratcrogan in County Roscommon. He was selected by the abbots as a young boy. And there's an interesting story about him taking the skin of a bull and turning its vellum into a Bible. This is all druidic Christian code. So that's really what they were. The early Christian high crosses what you call the classic celtic cross shape were originally pagan standing stones they were reshaped and recarved because they had that electromagnetic energy resonance frequency with inside them then after a while after a few generations stones would have not have been originally standing stones 
were then just carved in the Celtic cross. It was like branding. You'd look at McDonald's, right? The early days, McDonald's was a very different restaurant than what it became. It built a reputation on making high quality food cheaply and simply. Then after a few generations or a few years, people forget the original McDonald's, but the logo remains. And so they flock to the golden arches. The Celtic cross is the golden arches of Christianity in the, what they call the Celtic world. Originally based on something very real, carved from a standing stone, eventually turned into a, what they call a high cross. And a high cross is very different, even though it's the same shape and everything, than a Celtic cross because it comes direct. The high crosses came directly from men here's standing stones, pagan worshipping stones, and these were carved into crosses. There's no need to have all these looking for pi, looking for quadrants, looking for all these Victorian tweed jacketed and pipe smoking gentleman ideas to explain these things within a Greco Roman construct. It's really very simple. The Druids altered them just like they altered the ohm stones and put them into churches, just like they got the shield and the gigs and put them into churches. It was simple simply a way of making an easy transition from the pagan religion to Christianity in order to avoid a bloodbath. It's very simple and that is the mystery of the Celtic cross. Thank you.